uh, words and your kind introduction. Uh, it's obviously for me a very special evening where we have to be meeting with the colleagues, my fellow colleagues who are troops on the trenches who have taken up the arms uh, in one of the greatest wars of our era, the battle of the, with the unseen enemy of coronavirus. In a strange way, it's a kind of battle that has really activated us, not only through pain <clears throat> and suffering and anxiety, but has also you know, bound us together in a spirit of hope and love. It has actually made us more united as the people and particularly as health workers and as doctors. It has made us to be even more human and more humane more caring and uh, it has brought up on us a sense of uh, solidarity where we uh, support each other and have empathy across the board on people that we may not even have met but the nature of the crisis has really activated in us the sense of what each other what we mean to each other <clears throat> and therefore is a very special occasion today to be with you to celebrate some of the very exciting uh, innovations that you have come up to. Just the idea of coming together and sharing on your pain, on your frustration, on your hopes, on your experiences is a huge innovation because it is really not based on any specific affiliation. It's not based on any set and formal agenda. It is basically based on the fact that you, as humans, as soldiers, you have to extend a sense of uh, solidarity to some of those who are exper experiencing the same hardship and also uh, driven by the same commitment that you are. So today it's about you who are the frontline healthcare workers, the ones who are in the trenches who hold the human face and render the human touch to all the policies, to the regulations, to the science, to the academic uh, research, to all of which, had, which has flooded the health service uh, delivery space as we're confronted with this virus, which we had no precedent and no formula. And so we had to learn as we traverse the path. It's almost like you know, going, moving in a jungle and hoping to get the other side when we don't even know what the, the, the nature of the challenges that we are going to face. Unfortunately for us, no other part of the world had enough knowledge of this. So we were all in this together, having to traverse through a very difficult, uh, you know, an uncharted kind of territory. After all is said and done, it is the doctor who must look and uh, speak with the patient, uh, who must make a decision and broker the trust as he gives or she gives the diagnosis and recommends the treatment pathway. It is the doctor that must examine, that must test, probe, reassess, worry, and dedicate his abilities towards the management of life. This is important for us, because it's a doctor who has to do all of this while also grappling with his or her own uncertainties, with a rapidly evolving evidence Whatever you knew yesterday gets challenged the following day when new information comes up and you're no longer sure whether the approaches that you're taking are actually going to make the difference that you expected the day before. The, the, you, you are the one who has to face the patient, their fears, anxieties, and their frustration, and at the same time, the communities that have got the same kind of fear and the anxiety. And all of this adding an emotional burden which is about worrying about your own safety. The fear of knowing at any, each and every one time that the next patient might be the one that might infect you. And in so doing uh, that, you know, you may never know how your body will respond to this kind of uh, 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 infection. So I am here today to talk to you, just to also listen through as you express some of your thoughts, some of your concerns, some of your aspirations, some of the innovations, because even though this has been a difficult crisis, but it's also offered a lot of opportunities for new ideas 
a new uh, 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 innovation. I'm here also to celebrate the health professional and salute you all for the tier, uh, tenacity, resistance, uh, resilience that we have portrayed uh, that has positioned us as a, amongst the leaders in the uh, glo uh, global co uh, COVID-19 response. It's very, very important for us to recognize <clears throat> that all the people that we're talking about in South Africa who have recovered, we're talking about 83, 83%, 84% of people who have recovered, they actually have recovered in the hands of the health workers. And that is a huge achievement and the best kind of service that you can ever render to your own nation. The battle has not been without its casualties. Over 27,000 of our colleagues who have become infected with the virus and tragically, which has robbed us uh, of uh, uh, 240 of some of the talented healthcare workers. We mourn every soul lost uh, through this, uh, to this enemy. It is our duty to honor their sacrifice by committing fully to the safety and well-being of our health uh, healthcare workers. This is currently a critical issue of contemporary interest, as I'm sure you have all seen some of the labor unrest in the media environment. For our part as government, no matter what happens, we will continue to try to endeavor to uh, engage with structures representing health workers as we seek to create a new culture of mu mutual understanding and respect. It is in the best interest of our patients, it is imperative that we find one another as government and labor and engage uh, robustly on issues that are causing concerns for healthcare workers. I have uh, sat through <clears throat> with a number of uh, unions together. And at this point, I have said that if there's any one health worker who is raising a concern of safety, that matter has to be taken seriously and the only way of knowing that it has been corrected will be when both management and labor were certified that in fact that matter has been resolved. Because the people who know where the shoe pinches are those who are in the front line, irrespective of the assurances that you may be getting that everything is in order. So it is important therefore for us to say, we have taken a slogan that says, no PPE, no work, because we want to encourage all those who are in the leadership to take the issue of the protection of health workers very seriously. On a personal note, <clears throat> I must therefore uh, uh, express my deep appreciation to all the health workers who have really been the most able champions in this fight. Your passion, your commitment, your diligence, your love, your caring, and your love for science not only made my job of, of Minister of Health uh, so rewarding, but it has truly been the highlight of my career to partner and learn from the esteemed colleagues in the healthcare, as I've observed South African expertise pushed to its up to, uh, absolute cutting edge. And at each and every one time, and, and this I say on behalf of myself and many of the colleagues, when everybody asks us, what do you do? What inspires us <clears throat> as we move on? It is the sheer dedication and courage of the health workers on the ground who have not abandoned their post despite the immensity of an, the, an unknown enemy that is invisible, but they've dedicated their lives <clears throat> to go on and face the difficulties and make sure that they save the lives of our people. Your messages of support, encouragement, and optimism, even when we're in the darkest hours of search, gave me energy to, to keep going every day. And I want to say that you, because of the work that you have done, have inspired many people all over the world for looking at how we as South Africans have been able to unite in a united way, respond together as a unit in the fight against COVID-19. So as, we, as we're experiencing that uh, we have gone over the surge <clears throat> in the pandemic, let us not relent or fall into the trap of complacency, but rather ride the momentum so we can keep the, flat, the, uh, the curve flat and ensure that our facilities and yourselves do not become overwhelmed. We have now started to dismantle some of the field hospitals uh, in the city ICC, and uh, very soon we'll be looking at uh, <clears throat> NASRAC and some of the other 
facilities where we have uh, concluded that the field uh, uh, hospital beds are no longer necessary. However, we want to continue investing on those other facilities which are going to be refurbished and uh, maintained for future use, particularly the new installations of uh, bringing in uh, oxygen reticulation and also ensuring that we improve the equipment supply, the human resources in the various uh, uh, hospitals where there's been a shortage. We have also uh, been engaged in a discussion wherein we wanted to ensure that there's good cooperation between the private sector as the general practitioners or family practitioners at the same time with the uh, private sector specialists as well as the private hospitals. That discussion needs to continue because one of the things that we have, left, we have learned uh, uh, from the COVID-19 is that we are all the health sector. We are all the health services. We are providers united to provide the best quality care to South Africans, irrespective of whether we are public or private sector. And therefore that the future <clears throat> will be much better for all South Africans if, pri if private and public continue to work together in, with mutual respect, with cooperation, and ensuring that uh, as we move on, we remember that whatever we do, we do it together as members of the health sector uh, uh, to, uh, united in our focus on delivering the quality care. So moreover, therefore, let's use this crisis to advance uh, our cause for universal health coverage through the national health insurance. We're now, as we're now unified against COVID-19, let's not allow any disintegration of this uh, fr uh, fractional cohesion that has been forged between the clinicians, the scientists, the academics, the governments, the communities, the business, the labor, and all of us together. It is very, very important to ensure that uh, the commitment to collaborating together with the public and private and civil society in general becomes one of our uh, you know, uh, strengths as we move forward. Then for at this point, let me just uh, make a comment <clears throat> to indicate the latest as to where we are with our, uh, with our latest figures. As of today, uh, all of us <clears throat> will be aware that we're still having increasing numbers. However, today our cumulative total is at 611. 450 confirmed COVID-19 positive cases, where there's been a record of over 1,677 new cases which were identified. It's important to also mention the fact that over the past few weeks, our numbers of tests have been declining and the decline does not indicate that we are unable to test. Basically, all those who have been part of the surge were actually the largest numbers that we received in June, July, August. At this point on the same criteria, the numbers have decreased because the people who are presenting with the same criteria that we used to, uh, um, to do the test have actually been reduced. So this number is indicating therefore that we are increasing at a lower rate than was, uh, has been happening before. Uh, the total number of tests that has at this point been conducted is beyond 3.56 million. And uh, uh, in the last 24 hours, only 10,000 tests were conducted. But of course, these numbers, as I've said, they are indicating as well a, dec a decrease in the rate of uh, positive uh, uh, tests uh, as compared to the past where the figure was as high as 26%. It's gone below 20 at this point with various provinces giving different numbers. The private sector and public sector continue <clears throat> to work together in the, uh, in the tests that are being released. Regrettably, we still have a number of deaths that uh, tonight reported over 100, about 100 deaths that have uh, passed, uh, that have uh, um, uh, uh, been, the lives that have been lost in the past uh, 24 hours with uh, a COVID-19 related uh, diagnosis. 14 from Guazul Natal, 36 Mpumalanga, 12 from Gauteng, eight Limpopo, 11 Eastern Cape, 19 from Western Cape, bringing the number to 13,159. We do extend our condolences to the loved ones of those who have departed and thank all the health workers again that have treated uh, uh, all the deceased patients. Our recovery stand now at 84% at 516, 494. I think what uh, is also important is just to indicate 
at this point that uh, our ministerial advisory committee has actually uh, an, an, um, approved the use now of uh, serology antibody tests that have now been certified by SAPRA. And in this case, uh, it's important as well that uh, we want to start using those serology tests as part of the armament of uh, facing this uh, COVID-19 situation. All of us are aware that because there are antibody uh, type uh, of uh, tests, they will obviously show a little bit later, probably between seven to 10 days after the onset of the infection. But in some cases, particularly in the children, it tends not to show because they might quickly, you know, uh, the children might be um, negative uh, on, on PCR because of their, of their nature, and then this might be helpful. But in the process, we also want to indicate that uh, at the moment, these are going to be done at the level of uh, laboratories. Having said all of this, I want to say that the most important issue uh, which this uh, association of yours, this coming together has been helpful in is the idea of supporting each other, psychosocial support, uh, dealing with the issues of fears, uh, frustration and tension is a major issue, particularly when you find that the patients that you are looking after don't have their relatives coming through. So all they have is yourself as the doctor and the nurses. And one of the doctors has uh, uh, written a story on the Facebook saying that those patients uh, were worried that they would be alone, but many of them know that they were with you who have been the ones who were the, you know, the friends, who were the relatives, who were everything around them, giving them uh, courage during the difficult time. With all of that, we want to therefore say to you, your role as doctors, your role as health workers has actually helped our country to be able to face a formidable invisible enemy, and that is COVID-19. We want to thank you most sincerely. We want to also congratulate you for all the work that you have done. And we want to say to you, South Africa is very proud of the work that you have done. And let's send this message to all the health workers to say you are the heroes of our country. And at that level, we salute you all and thank you for the good work that you have done for our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Nkizim. It's the motivation of those words, I think, that make doctors able to, to carry on in this ongoing fight. Um, I think that the unity that is experienced amongst doctors right across this country at the moment is something that certainly many of us have never seen before. Um, and certainly the encouraging numbers are something that just really gives us so much motivation to carry on with our work, whether it's us doing it or not or contributing to it or not substantially, we don't know, but we certainly know that when you're winning the game and you're working hard as a group, you feel very inspired to carry on. So we are very grateful for those words. Um, just a few points of order, just going forward. We've turned the chat off because it's quite distracting to the speakers and to the people asking the questions. If there's two parallel conversations going on at the same time, we will be able hopefully to switch it on later. The other thing is that there are lots of questions coming through. I've seen the 63 questions already. Um, on a webinar is Dan Stillerman, who's thankfully helping us run this webinar from Dan is from the Excel Academy and he runs webinars for doctors and non-doctors. Um, as Dan has said, you, you, on a webinar, you're able to upvote a question. So if you look at the, on the left-hand side of the questions, you'll see a little thumbs up just like on Facebook and you're able to tick it if you like the question. I think that's really helpful to us when we have so many questions because when it comes to answering these questions, we'll be able to see we don't have to repeat the same questions again and again and please, please go through the questions and, and actually tick them if you'd like to, them to be asked and the other thing is that if you'd like to ask a question yourself please write in capitals at the beginning of your question i'd like to ask this and we'll hopefully be able to have the time to promote you to the panel at the end and you know you can ask your question this is a sharing platform and please also write who you'd like to ask the question to um so but without much further ado i'd like to ask um, Professor Salim Abdul Karim to, to, to speak to us. And then after that, we'll take some questions for the minister and for Prof Karim. Um, Prof Karim is a professor of public health um, at he, more than one place. He's a professor at Columbia University. Um, he's also obviously a professor in, at, in South Africa. He's a professor of immunology and infectious disease at Harvard. Um, he's the head of the 45 person 
um, ministerial advisory committee, um, and um, he, he's achieved many accolades. I mean, you can actually see on his slide that he's sharing at the moment some of um, he, his positions. And I, I won't waste his time by going through all these things, but we are so grateful to have him with us. Thank you for coming back again, and let me hand over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Israel. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be uh, with you here this evening. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Minister Nkizi, Dr. Israel, Professor Richards, Dr. Jankolo. It's a great pleasure and honor to share with you this evening, very briefly, an update on COVID-19 in South Africa. Originally, I was intended just to come and do a Q&A on the presentation I did uh, what, is it, what, just over a week ago. Uh, but most of you have not seen that presentation, so it won't make sense to have the Q&A without the presentation. So I've prepared a short, a very simple presentation just to give you an update on the situation of COVID-19 in South Africa. When we want to look at the epidemic, we can look at it in many different ways. Some like cumulative cases, some like number of new cases. The way in which we can look at it that gives us, uh, that gets away from a lot of the background noise that you see in the daily numbers is to develop just an average. And we take seven days, that way you get rid of the weekends because the weekends often create a bit of a trough. And if you look at that, one of the things that becomes very clear is the way in which our epidemic grew, reached a peak, and now is on the decline. Now, all epidemics follow this. It's pretty standard for epidemics. They go up, they plateau, and they come down. It's just a question of how high the plateau, how long the plateau, and what's the rate of increase and decrease. Well, if you look at in South Africa, it's heavily influenced by the different epidemics we have in the various provinces. So if you look at the very early stages, if you can see my cursor, that if you look at April and May, mostly the black line was influenced by the green line. The green line is the Western Cape. So our epidemic pretty much followed the curve of the Western Cape because the epidemic grew first in the Western Cape and was well established in the Western Cape weeks before it got to the other provinces. And then following the Western Cape, we saw the Eastern Cape starting to rise. That's the blue line. And then if you take June the 1st, that's when we eased our restrictions and went to, to level three. You, you can work on the basis that roughly about a week to 10 days after you ease restrictions, you should expect to see an increase in numbers. That's just taking the incubation period into account. And so by the 10th of June, you can see Gauteng really taking off. And the black line, that's the overall South African epidemic curve, is heavily influenced by the red line, that's the Gauteng numbers. And then as Gauteng comes down, so too does the overall line. With KwaZulu-Natal providing a boost that's in the orange line for the overall numbers. So this is the, the picture we are seeing. And right now what's been particularly uh, reassuring is the way in which the numbers have declined both in KwaZulu-Natal and in the Free State, because those are the two provinces that didn't have a settled trend when I gave my talk the last time. So overall, what we're seeing is a decline that is pretty consistent, coming down a bit of a bump, which came actually from slight increase in cases over three days in, in Gauteng, but more or less it's settling down and going downwards. Now, when we look at the epidemic, we should never look at cases on their own because that's influenced by your testing, it's influenced by a range of different things. And what you look at is that you want to look at your cases, but also your admissions. Because if your cases are going down and your admissions are going down, then you know that the two corroborate with one another. In fact, we look at another measure as well called the uh, positive proportion 
positive test proportion. And I'll look at that in a minute. But it's quite reassuring that in the DATCOV data, this is of Sentinel Hospital, so it's not the total of it, admissions in the country, but certainly in, when we look at the Sentinel Hospitals, which comprise most of the private hospitals and some of the public hospitals, you can see the way in which admissions have steadily come down as the overall number of cases has declined. Deaths take a little while longer. So deaths have a two to three week lag. So you don't see deaths declining in the same rate because people are often in hospital for a week, two, three weeks before they die. So you will see that lag in deaths. So several people have raised the question in the chat as to how do we know whether the numbers are reliable? Well, the situation is that the numbers are not really you know, 100% accurate. They, they're not accurate in any case because there are large numbers of patients who or people getting infected who are either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, and they don't ever come forward for testing. So in all situations, we expect the testing and the numbers to be an undercount. The question is, how stable is that undercount? In other words, is that undercounting shifting? And if we look at since the 1st of June, we've had pretty much the same testing strategy because we, once we eased restrictions, we knew we had to prepare for the surge, so we prioritized our healthcare services. So the highest priority, which is a red uh, dot, are those are inpatients, patients presenting as PUI and healthcare workers. So that's our high priority because we, when we run short of tests, we need to prioritize. So that has remained in place for almost a good two months. So the testing algorithm has been fairly stable. And you can see in the blue, this is the daily number of tests. Again, this is a seven day average. So it's the average for that week. And you can see that at the peak, we had gone above 45,000 tests per day. But then as we completed the peak and as we started coming down, the number of tests started declining. Now, over the last three weeks, it's pretty much settled down into around sort of 20 to 25,000 tests per day. So the, the concern would be that if we were concerned that we were not doing the, the tests that were coming in, then we should have a backlog. Well, none of the laboratories in the NHLS have a backlog at the moment. So every swab that is coming into the labs is being tested. So now we know that the testing strategy has remained the same. We have no backlog. So it's not a question of running out of kits. And if you look at this stability that we are getting in the number of, of tests that we are doing on average per day, what is striking is the way in which the positive test proportion, that is, of all the tests we do, how many are positive, that has steadily declined. So that means that's a reflection of the people we are testing. There are fewer and fewer of them who are positive. So that's very reassuring. So now you've got the cases coming down. You've got the proportion that's positive coming down, even though the number of tests has remained fairly stable. The proportion has steadily come down and we know the admissions have come down. So all of those in combination give us confidence that the epidemic is now on the downward curve. And if we look at the cumulative number, you can see that very early in our epidemic, right from the time we had our first patient on the 5th of March, our epidemic was growing rapidly at the same rate as the UK epidemic. It was doubling every two days. But what happened was the declaration of the state of disaster, which closed the schools, stopped the mass gatherings, uh, stopped international travel, uh, instituted the lockdown. And what happens is that it slows the spread of the virus. So we went from doubling every two days to doubling every 15 days. And then as we eased restrictions, we started seeing the doubling go up. Uh, in other words, uh, the, 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 the rate of doubling getting shorter and shorter. But then 
as we went further with the increasing numbers, the doubling time now starts getting higher. And now in August, we have a doubling time of 79 days, which again reflects the decline. So you can see this pattern indicating the way in which our epidemic has grown. And now that we are over the, the, the plateau and on the decline. So the question I'm asked, is the worst over? Well, I'm sorry to say that that's not entirely 100% answer at this point. Even though it's pretty convincing that we are on the decline, we have to remain vigilant because of the possibility of a second surge. So if you compare our epidemic curve to say Germany, Germany had its epidemic very early on. All of these start from day naught. And they went up to about 5,000 cases per day. They went down and then they have remained at this low level. It's a sort of, I call it a simmering level. Basically you have just endemic transmission. However, if you look at the US, they went up, they went to the plateau and they started coming down. But because the ease restrictions too rapidly, the epidemic went up again. And that's what is a big concern because our epidemic could take a turn and go upwards again if we end up with a situation where we create the opportunity for super spreading to occur and where we ease restrictions too rapidly. So we have to do so in a very systematic way that doesn't place us in the same situation that we've seen in the US of having a second surge linked to the first surge. Or we could go into this kind of situation, which is in Spain, where you had a first epidemic, it came down to endemicity, and now Spain is in the midst of its second surge. In fact, I didn't update this, but now they have more infections and very rapid rise in infections. And Spain is in the midst of a serious epidemic right now in its second surge, which just goes to show that you really can't let your guard down. If you let your guard down and if we even for, for a short while lose or get complacent about our prevention strategies, our social distancing, mask wearing and hand washing, the second surge is waiting to pounce. So let's just look at the second surge. Is it inevitable? Well, uh, just, you know, just over 10 days ago, uh, New Zealand announced to the whole world that they had successfully eliminated COVID-19 transmission. It was uh, headlines because for 100 days, they had no local transmission. And if you look at this graph on the left-hand side, you can see I've put in here some of the countries that have done well and some of the countries that have had quite severe epidemics. Well, New Zealand is not on its own. Singapore similarly did superbly well. Vietnam had so few infections. I think Vietnam had a handful of deaths only. South Korea is a success story used over and over. These are the countries that had some of the best strategies, including New Zealand, uh, Australia, South Korea, Vietnam, in containing the epidemic initially. Well, every one of them has now been dealing with the second surge. New Zealand, of course, is back to lockdown. They've now got over 50 new cases. Singapore had a huge outbreak in the uh, hostels where the migrant workers live. Vietnam is weird. I mean, the number of infections in Vietnam is rapidly rising, much more severe than their first uh, uh, surge. And South Korea, similarly, huge wave of second infections that uh, uh, ravaging South Korea. So all of these countries have had to deal with it. So let's just look at how this epidemic has changed our lives and changed the world before I wrap up. So I'm going to show you the world on the first of each month. So this is the first of March. I want you to look at the way in which the colors change. Blue means that there's no measures. There's no epidemic, no uh, evidence of any uh, intervention. And yellow means that that country has some restrictions, but they are purely of a voluntary nature. And orange means that that country has restrictions in place with the dark orange close to being a lockdown. 
So if we look at the 1st of March, we're pretty much looking at lockdowns in Italy and in China, but most of the rest of the world, no restrictions. In India, I had a few optional uh, control measures. The 1st of April, 30 days later, our world has changed. Most of Asia is now under lockdown, parts of South America, parts of, of Africa, and there are now some optional uh, restrictions in Australia. And on the 1st of April, 86 countries had national or subnational lockdowns. One month later, on the 1st of May, you can see China is now over with its worst, so it's releasing its restrictions. India is now under severe lockdown. Parts of Russia still remain under lockdown. Africa is mostly under restrictions at this time. Both Australia and New Zealand under restrictions, 1st of May. Let's look at the 1st of June. 1st of June, South Africa is easing its restrictions. So too are many other countries. Australia and New Zealand have gone back to no restrictions, even started playing rugby with the uh, spectators. And China is back under a lockdown. Huge epidemic and spread of the virus in Beijing go under lockdown again. The 1st of July, uh, Australia and New Zealand, no problems. They still have no restrictions. Much of Southern Africa, minimal restrictions. China still, through the Beijing epidemic, still in lockdown. And now come the 1st of August, we went to uh, level three plus, and you can now see Australia is back under lockdown. So you get a sense of how our world is changing month by month. And it's almost like this virus is controlling our world and defining how we, we live our lives month by month. And I'll end off by just saying, you know, we always uh, uh, raise the issue of, you know, the huge impact it's having on our countries. But it's just important to remember that the whole world is going through this situation. That if we look at, you know, the BRICS countries across the board, all of them have had an impact on their GDP. So this last column tells you the way in which the GDP growth is expected to be impacted for this year. So you can see Brazil from going from plus 1.1 is expected to be now at minus 5.3. China at plus 6.1 now is down to plus 1.2, but at least they are in the positive range. South Africa, which had very low growth rate to start with, is anticipated to have minus 5.8. Sweden, which had no lockdown, is anticipated to be at minus 6.8. And then when you look at Australia and New Zealand, you can see they've been hugely impacted. In fact, Australia has now gone into a recession, expected to go from plus 1.9% to minus 6.7%. And New Zealand, which was claiming elimination just recently, was anticipated to have a huge impact on its GDP at minus 7.2. So the point I want to make is that this is impacting our whole world. And as the world grapples with this, we have to recover from the virus and we have to recover from the impact it has on our economies and on our lives. And we can do that. It is possible to actually overcome. These predictions and these estimates do not have to be the case. We can safely start re-energizing the economy. We can start safely moving around if we follow the rules. But if we become complacent, we run the risk of a second surge. So I hope that's given you a sense of, you know, an update on the epidemic and given you a flavor of the way things have developed. Thank you very much, Dr. Zay. Thank you, Prof. Karim. That certainly has. Um, and, and I can see it's also answered a lot of the questions in the, in the Q&A already. So, you know, it gives us insights as to what's going on with the figures. I'm sure there will be questions further. So what, what I'd like to do at this point is perhaps take a couple of live questions. Um, and so, so if possible, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just promote one or two questions to the one or two um, participants to the panel. If we could promote uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Bronwyn Moore. So Dr. Bronwyn Moore is actually um, spoken to our 
GGPC before. Uh, Dr. Moore is an obstetrician and gynecologist at NetCare Park Lane. And um, she, she's asking some interesting questions here. And I think that will be to Prof. Karim. And then if afterwards we could ask Dr. Sherry Fanneroff to who uh, will ask the Minister, Dr. Minister Mkiza question as well. So, um, um, Dan, are we able to add Bronwyn to the panel? I'm here, Dan. Okay, great. Go ahead. Evening all, and thank you once again for a very informative evening. I really um, must commend the group on, on excellent sessions that they've set, set together and, and, and put together for us. Prof Karim, I'm just interested to hear what your thoughts are on why we've seen such a difference in our trends and our numbers in this country. Whether you think that there is anything behind the theory we all heard at one point about whether or not the BCG vaccine was perhaps going to offer us some degree of protection, um, we know that in this country it became compulsory around about 1973 odd. Lots of people did have it before then, but we also know that a large percentage of our population has at some point had primary TB. And if the vaccine, if you feel that the vaccine is offering some protection, whether perhaps having had prior TB might then be, be doing something similar. Sure. So when this hypothesis was first raised, it was raised as an ecological study. And so there was really not much evidence. Since then, several serious scientists have looked into this matter. Most notably, Professor Bob Gallo from the Institute of Human Virology published a paper on this issue. And basically it applies to any vaccination, not just to BCG. If it's a live vaccine and a live attenuated vaccine, there is an element of what is called trained immunity. And there's a nice sort of view of trained immunity in nature that was published. And it's thought that BCG may be instituting that kind of trained immunity so that when the coronavirus comes along, the body is better placed to respond. Unfortunately, the evidence for that is flimsy at best. So right now, there is really no evidence to suggest that receiving polio vaccination, BCG vaccination, or measles vaccination provide any trained immunity that gives you a benefit. There's a second school of thought, which was recent two papers from uh, Shane Crotty and his group in San Diego that looked at whether there was pre-existing immunity from the other coronaviruses. So there are four coronaviruses that routinely we all get them uh, they give you a bit of a snotty nose, they're mild colds. And so there's a hypothesis that if you've had one of those coronaviruses, that there is cross immunity because the T cell responses against those coronaviruses also react to SARS-CoV-2. But the evidence now suggests that, you know, it's not clear whether they make any difference because they actually make no difference to the four coronaviruses. You keep getting reinfected with coronaviruses. And maybe I'll use the opportunity, if you don't mind, just to answer the question about reinfection. So when a person gets infected with SARS-CoV-2, the infectious period where the virus can be grown is roughly about seven days or so. Thereafter, the PCR remains positive for at least another week or two, but the virus is dead. There is no virus that can be cultured. In some individuals, the PCR can remain positive for up to three months. And so that's just persistent shedding of dead virus because the antibody response has come up, the antibodies have neutralized the virus, the virus is still being shed, and so the PCR remains positive, but you can't culture the virus. So some people have mistaken that for reinfection. However, today, things changed. There's a first report from Hong Kong of a person who now has very clear evidence of two separate viruses. The first was the Hong Kong strain, and the second was when he went to Spain and came back and was reinfected with a different strain of the virus. And they have the two strains and can show that they were two independent strains of the virus that this person had. The infection took place four and a half months apart. 
which fits in with our concern that antibody responses decline. So now we have the first evidence that reinfection can occur. It's not clear whether it's going to be common. And at this point, it doesn't look like it's common, but it can occur. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Prof. Thanks, Prof. Okay, um, let's ask um, Dr. Fanaroff, who's a family physician in Melrose, if she would like to ask a question to uh, Minister Mkiza. And Dr. Turn Fenner, off, turn on your... uh, yeah, I've just asked you to unmute. Sorry. <sighs> Sorry about that. Um, good evening to the minister and to all the panelists. And thanks to the minister for your very inspirational words and for your leadership throughout the pandemic. What, uh, what my question was is a lot of models and statistics have influenced our reaction to the pandemic and how things have been managed. Um, I wanted to ask what your thoughts are on the PANDA predictions. At least some of the PANDA predictions have been correct um, in terms of our lower mortality rate than we expected. And they were correct about when we reached our peak. So I, I wanted to know if you had a comment on whether you thought they were correct in that the Western Cape was very close to reaching herd immunity. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fanarov. <clears throat> very interesting question that we get uh, to face every now and again. <clears throat> it comes from the fact that uh, there has been lots of debate about whether we have taken decisions based on uh, uh, incorrect uh, assumptions and so on. Now, uh, Panda did make a statement criticizing the uh, other uh, modelers on this matter. <clears throat> uh, if I just indicate the first few days, if you saw what uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Abdul Karim showed, the first few days that showed the doubling time of the pandemic <clears throat> being two days was really at the time when we didn't have much of models. There were, not, there were no models and even the one that came soon thereafter was a model which uh, was kind of Away, uh, away, because uh, away from the reality, because uh, there wasn't enough information, there was not enough data from South Africa to recalibrate it to bring it closer to what the reality would have been. So we actually sure. took the decision around uh, <clears throat> around um, uh, uh, the lockdown based on what we saw as the doubling time, which was really the main uh, information that we had at the time. Then later on, as more information became available, <clears throat> we then started seeing the numbers uh, being uh, fitted onto the model and then there was a bit of recalibration. What we used those numbers largely for was to look at the you know, uh, extremities of what the potential, the worst put, uh, possible scenarios would be in the, in the, <clears throat> in the sense of uh, uh, how bad this uh, situation could be uh, for purposes of estimating the resource requirements. So if those were the numbers, what numbers of beds could we need? What numbers of ventilators might we need? What numbers of staff might we need? And therefore we use it to guide that. But what we had done at that point, we had actually pulled together a number of different uh, groups of modelers and they were put together into a consortium. And then uh, we allowed the debate to go on because obviously <clears throat> amongst themselves, Lots of discussion that really helped them to re, uh, um, uh, and to understand the situation differently. Now, the in the last week <clears throat> there was a discussion between Panda and the uh, uh, the uh, consortium that we were using, and uh, it appeared to me from the report that there might be differences in the methodology and the way that they are looking at uh, exactly what uh, the uh, situation is. And from the point of view. Uh, from the point of view of uh, the consortium, it looked like as, as, uh, Panda was looking, uh, you know, from figures based on what has already existed. And so there's a bit of a debate about whether they are measuring exactly the same issue. I wouldn't then get involved in this. I would love to get them to come here and then answer to all of you who's looking at what. But the point that you are raising is an interesting point that in fact, 
I think that science must be able to give us an answer. Because you see, in the Western Cape, the numbers went out of control immediately during the lockdown. They went very high up. And at some point, two thirds of the positive cases were only in the Western Cape, and one third was the rest of the country. We can't explain why they were more prone to um, you know, cluster outbreaks than the rest of the country. But then we had a challenge with all the uh, 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 contact tracing and isolation and quarantine. So when the situation came, when, when the numbers went to a, a, a climax and started to plateau, we do know that there wasn't a much stronger uh, you know, qu quarantine track and tracing program because even the community was not very receptive to that. So whether in fact there's adequate herd immunity in the, in the, in the, in the community, it would be a very interesting issue that we need uh, to do a bit of research to, to establish. We don't have any concrete information yet, but certainly something has happened because why uh, have the numbers uh, changed? But we couldn't explain why there could have been the numbers uh, went in the same way in the Western Cape and then uh, the, rest of the rest of the provinces were uh, having a different uh, uh, you know, uh, situation. And we also still can't explain <clears throat> what would have determined that uh, Eastern Cape uh, should turn uh, quickly down, but then the other two provinces go up. So maybe the issue of immunity, but I don't think at this point, nobody actually gave us any evidence of that. And uh, we, we also haven't done any such research so I think it's something that we need to find out probably long after uh, we, we know the, the, the search is passed because that's the only time we'll have people to look at uh, various other factors. It's an interesting proposition. Um, uh, the other question for us has been, is there something else in the environment, for example? Now, uh, there have been a few uh, interesting points that I think uh, it would be nice if uh, Professor Abdul Karim could comment. Was when there was an issue raised around the issue of sunlight. Uh, well, the Eastern Cape and Guazulu Natal and Western Cape do not behave the same way. So why would they, when they've got the same kind of range of exposure, some raise an issue of uh, uh, um, uh, altitude and atmospheric uh, uh, you know, pressure at the coastal area and so on. Again, we don't have concrete evidence thereof, but some also raise the question why the mortality was a bit lower in Gauteng. Is that only an undercount or is something wrong there? Even today, Western Cape has still got a higher mortality than Western Cape, than, than Gauteng. Is that the function of an undercount or something else? We don't know. I think that it's really opened up a lot of space for additional research to be done. But uh, all these questions have to be continuously asked so that we must ultimately look for the answers. Maybe Professor Abdul Karim might also like to add his own uh, um, understanding of this issue. But thank you very much for the question. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nkiza. I think what I'm gonna do before we come back to this question is I'm gonna take one more question before I move to Prof. Richards, because I'd, I'd like to keep the momentum going and then we can come back to, I know at the end we'll try and like move through a lot of questions that are on the Q&A. So um, if, if I can, um, and and uh, I, I don't know whether he's given consent yet, but Dr. Gulab, um, who has asked a question we've promoted to the panel, um, Dr. Gunvant Gulab, would you like to ask your question to either Dr. Nkizelt or Professor Karim? Uh, thank you, Dr. Israel, and good evening to our minister and uh, Professor Karim. Uh, my question is around how do we leverage uh, a comprehensive testing st strategy, which includes PCR antibody and antigen testing uh, to prevent uh, a second surge uh, going forward. And then secondly, how can we apply the learnings of COVID to the challenges of uh, other uh, challenges in our country, such as diabetes, motor vehicle accidents, and ultimately in terms of the economy, unemployment? Thank you. So if it's okay, what I'll do is if we can just channel the first question um, to, to Prof Karim, and I might even pause you on the second question just in terms of time, because that is a really interesting question, but it's going to be quite a long discussion, and we can possibly visit that at the end of the webinar. But um, Prof Karim, can I, can I hand? Sure. So Dr. Gulab actually raises a really critical question that we're having to grapple with. So let me just tell you, we've been through now 
four different testing strategies because you have to adapt your testing strategy to the demand. So when we first started, we focused on travelers and their contacts because that was the higher risk group. Then we had to change because we needed to look for cases. So we shifted to a community testing strategy, but then we found we were running short of kits. And so we prioritized them to hospital patients. So we have been adapting our testing strategy to the changing conditions. Now that we are post the surge and we're going into decline, our priority had been to focus on hospital patients. That will now change. We now it has to change because we have to move to stage eight of our eight stages of our response. And stage eight is vigilance. So now we have to be on the hunt for possible areas that can ignite a second surge. So that means we have to switch to a surveillance mode. So we'll continue to do the testing in hospital patients because that remains a priority, but the numbers are coming down so rapidly that within the next week or so, we should hit the critical percentage of 10%. As soon as we're below 10%, then we know we are testing adequate numbers of patients. So that will allow us then to now switch to a district level model of testing. And when we are testing, we will continue to use PCR, but we were now adding antibody testing. And we're doing so in two ways. We're doing a national survey that is being led by the HSRC together with the MRC and the NHLS and the NICD. And that will give us a measure of the full extent of viral exposure. And secondly, we will see a steady implementation of antibody testing together with uh, PCR testing to look and identify infections that are asymptomatic because we know they also transmit and they can also lead to the second wave. So that's our new testing strategy. It's not yet in place. It's still under discussion at the MAC and we'll submit an advisory to the Department of Health, hopefully within the next week or so. Great, thanks. That's really interesting. So we're getting the top of the, the the, the top of the scoop here. Thanks, Prof. Um, okay, so, so if I could move on now, because we, we're definitely going to come back to questions for, for our two experts who have just spoken to us, but let, let's try and bring in the clinical side here. Yeah? We're all, we all doctors here from the beginning, so um, let's move on for now and come back to these issues just now. We, we're very privileged to have Prof Guy Richards with us. Um, I, I still remember my first internal medicine call ever when I had been up for 30 hours, however long it was and doing the post intake ward round. And I was, I, I couldn't even think straight. And I was overwhelmed by a flood of academic information by, by someone who I started to learn from an, at, at WITS in those days. And we now years later continue to learn from a, someone who's become really like a maestro in internal medicine and critical care and Prof Richards, um, graduated in 1978 and, and then it became a physician in 1985. He became a pulmonologist and, and intensivist and he got his PhD in medicine in 1992. He's the Emeritus uh, Professor of Critical Care at Wits University. He headed critical care at um, Charlotte Matecheke Hospital. And he, um, you know, of real interest here is that you are right at the beginning of this COVID-19 pandemic, he started writing up protocols, both for hospital um, settings and more recently he's been talking about as well. And he will speak about managing COVID, not in the hospital setting. And he really was one of the proponents and I, I don't know for, um, you know, early steroid use perhaps and high flow oxygen and 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 one could say like really through his work like thousands of lives have been saved and certainly even in you know the private sector prof richard runs whatsapp groups that the doctor that the that the intensivists are on and when they get into a stuck problem they turn to prof richard so we're very grateful to have him with us and um we have a lot to learn from him and thank you for joining us and we're keen to hear you what you have to share Thank you, Dan, for that uh, nice uh, introduction. Of course, an emeritus professor just means that you're old. It means that uh, you've been retired and uh, now you sit in the background and, uh, and advise and consult and, and try to teach as far as we possibly can. 
So today, and I just first of all like to greet all the fellow our fellow uh, panelists and especially the minister. And uh, it's very nice to be along with you to be able to talk on this topic. So I'm going to be talking on home therapy, and initially, in order to do so, we need to actually just remember this early uh, graph that was actually uh, published, which looked at the various phases of the response itself. And as you can see, there's initially a viral response where you get your mild constitutional symptoms, fever, dry cough, diarrhea, headache, lymphopenia, increased prothrombin time, D-dimer, and LDH. And of course, that's where the majority of the patients who are at home who have clinical symptoms actually remain. The ones that we see mostly are those in the pulmonary phase where you come in with infiltrates and pneumonia, and thereafter, you potentially are going to get the host inflammatory response where you may actually now get ARDS, other organ dysfunction, SIR, shock, cardiac failure, and very elevated inflammatory response. And of course, your mortality increases as you go to the right of this graph as we look at it. And if we look at the mechanism of the actual infection, you can see that there is an ACE2 receptor. The virus binds to that ACE2 receptor. It then requires this mediator, the TMPRSS2, which cleaves off the spike protein over there and allows the virus to then replicate. And of course, as it replicates, it then induces an inflammatory response. That means you start to get production of cytokines like IL-6. Those cytokines then induce or cause a capillary leak along with IL-2. You also get activated T cells, which come in and damage the capillary, and this causes capillary leak and more cytokines that are released. And of course, the procoagulin state, which is a major problem, which is actually related to a membrane attack complex and to an increase in your von Willebrand factor and an increase in factor eight. And all of that actually occurs at the site of the virus binding. And where does the virus bind? But the virus obviously binds, obviously initially to the upper respiratory tract, but thereafter, when it descends into the lung, it binds to the endothelium in the lung, and that then causes, or the epithelium in the lung, and that then causes all of these parameters to go out of kilter and cause this major and inflammatory response. Uh, we also then see hypofibrinolysis as well, with a decrease in the clot formation. So how are we going to treat it at home? There's been a worry, should we give all these patients antibiotics? But even as early as uh, China, the, the outbreak in China, we saw 1,099 patients from China, and in all of these, the procalcitonin was low. And in more than 96% with low disease severity, we saw this low procalcitonin, and there was no adverse outcome if you didn't give antibiotics. Most patients, in fact, had a PCT of less than 0.25, and this correlated with findings from other virus infections with hospitalized patients. And if you did have a viral, a bacterial infection, the PCT would then elevate, but it would elevate usually, certainly in South Africa, to much higher levels than the one or so that the package insert on PCT says. And once you're getting up to PCTs up in the region of 10, 20, 30, you would start worrying about coexistent bacterial infection. But even that's not common. This was a paper in 38 Michigan hospitals. Early empiric antibacterials were prescribed to 56% of the patients that were hospitalized, while in fact only 3.5% had a confirmed community onset bacterial co-infection. And in fact, amongst hospitals in the group, empiric antibacterial use varied from 27% up to 84%. And we recently wrote an editorial in the SMJ worrying about the impact of antimicrobial stewardship on antimicrobial stewardship in hospitals as well. In, I, I just need to say a few words briefly on, uh, on hydroxychloroquine. I think the whole issue has been uh, solved and discussed, and I don't really want to induce uh, a, a cause there to be further discussion about it. Effectively, it doesn't work. This was a study looking at it with post-exposure prophylaxis, and uh, within four days after exposure, the participants received placebo or hydroxychloroquine. They got big doses of them as well. 87.6% uh, had high risk exposure, and the onset of new illness did not differ. 11.8% in the hydroxychloroquine, placebo 14.3, and that was a non-significant difference that actually occurred. Then in, multi, in mild to moderate uh, COVID-19, uh, they looked at a score, a clinical score, a seven-point ordinal scale to assess the severity of illness. 
667 patients, and they looked at that at 15 days, and this was not affected by hydroxychloroquine or a combination with azithromycin. So there was no benefit whatsoever uh, at, at, with, in that study. Then to go a little bit uh, further in terms of COVID pneumonia, looking at the overall survival, this was a BMJ study, uh, overall survival at day 21 was 89% in the hydroxychloroquine group versus 91% in uh, the uh, placebo or the control group. And the survival uh, without ARDS at uh, 21 was 69% versus 74. And there was no difference in the number weaned from oxygen at day 21. So no benefit in that setting as well. Then, of course, came the recovery trial. The hydroxychloroquine patients were less likely to be discharged alive within 28 days, 60.3% versus 62.8. This was the first randomized controlled trial looking at it as well. The rate ratio, 0.92, uh, you were more likely to reach the end point of, of mechanical ventilation or death, 29.8% versus 26.5% with a risk ratio that actually achieved significance at 1.12, but there was no excess of major new uh, cardiac arrhythmias and so on. So if we're looking at, at antivirals and hydroxychloroquine was supposed to be an antiviral, uh, <clears throat> this was uh, the first of the randomized controlled trials of remdesivir. 237 patients were planned 437. They actually ran out of patients to actually find enough to include so it therefore became an underpowered study overall. So in the setting, 158 to remdesivir and 79 to placebo. 14% of the remdesivir patients died versus 13% with placebo. And then they took a subgroup analysis from an already underpowered study of remdesivir that, that looked at it, whether it was administered more than or less than 10 days after symptom onset. And the remdesivir in this group had a not significant faster clinical improvement, but the authors did give prominence to the subgroup. But there was no signal that the viral load actually decreased uh, differentially. There was a subsequent randomized double-blind trial in adults hospitalized with COVID-19 with low respiratory tract infection, giving the standard dose of 200 load then 100 milligrams daily or placebo. The remdesivir group had a median recovery time of 11, versus 15 days. That was a rate ratio for recovery of 1.32. In other words, it was faster. And the Kaplan-Meier estimates of mortality by 14 days were 7.1% with remdesivir versus 11.9% uh, for the controls of those without it. The hazard ratio for death was 0.7, but that was not significant. Serious adverse events uh, were 21% in the remdesivir versus 27% in the controls. So no good mortality benefit, but a faster rate of recovery, it appears. Then there was another study, data that was presented at the virtual COVID-19 conference as part of the 23rd International AIDS Conference. They looked at a comparative pre-planned analysis in the simple severe study versus a real world retrospective cohort. So it was not a randomized controlled trial. It was looking at a retrospective cohort of 818 patients that had similar baseline characteristics and severity, who received a standard of care in the same time period. And if they compared them with that group, remdesivir significantly improved recovery and reduced risk of mortality uh, by 62%, 74% recovered. Uh, this again was defined by that same seven point ordinal scale uh, by day 14 versus 59%. The mortality was 7.6% at day 14 versus 12.5% in the standard of care group. Now, again, do remember it's not a randomized controlled trial. It's compared with a retrospective group, and that therefore does not give us definite evidence of an improvement in mortality as well. This is a protocol that we developed uh, in Gauteng, uh, looking at remdesivir to use. Uh, availability is limited, it's expensive, and it's an IV preparation. So not for outpatients. Hospitalized patients, therefore, those requiring oxygen to main saturation and patients requiring mechanical ventilation on admission. Now, the exclusions actually do take out many of the more severe patients. Uh, patients, for example, requiring ECMO for oxygenation. It is a little bit controversial because if you do require ECMO very early, 
you may still need have a need to, to decrease the viral load. Any patients with severe underlying comorbidities likely to shorten lifespan, multi-organ failure with a high predicted mortality. If you've been on a mechanical ventilator for more than five days, it's unlikely that the virus is actually active at this time. And again, age 80, more than 80 years, again, controversial, only because of the fact that these people have uh, had a large, uh, uh, given a large amount of their lives to society over this period of time. And very often you have very little else to give these patients to improve them as well. Do you remember that other antivirals are things like heparins and past investigations of the biology of, biology of the SARS viruses has found that heparin reduced SARS-CoV uh, infectivity by 50%. And this may well be by a nonspecific polyanion blocking the charged spike protein from binding to that ACE2 receptor or from inhibition of cleavage of the S protein into activated components by coagulation factor 10. Uh, we're not exactly so sure how it actually works. But if you look here in the middle of this uh, slide, low molecular weight really is only of benefit in those with more extensive thrombosis, i.e. sepsis-induced coagulopathy uh, with a score of more than four, and that indicates severe coagulopathy, or a D-dimer more than sixfold of the upper uh, limit of normal, 32.8% versus 52% overall. But it did reduce the hypercoagulability, inhibited IL-6 and its biological activity, and potentially blocked the cytokine storm. So corticosteroids, we know about, we've heard about them. 396 consecutive patients received the one milligram per kilogram per day of methylpred in this study. The global mortality is 15.1%. Uh, the median time from corticosteroid for, to corticosteroid from symptom onset was 10 days. In hospital mortality was 13.9% for the corticosteroids versus 23.9% in the group that didn't receive them as well. And this was a 41.8% reduction. And of course, the dexamethasone study, which you actually saw, the dex reduced the death significantly. Mechanically ventilated patients had a rate ratio of 0.65. In other words, a 35% reduction. And in those on oxygen alone, there was a 20% reduction preventing one death per eight patients for those ventilated and one in 25 for those requiring oxygen. So it's not a lifesaver, but it certainly does reduce the mortality if used appropriately as well. We're not 100% sure on the type of corticosteroid, the timing, dose, or duration. Uh, the dose of DEX was half, roughly half of that used in pneumocystis. We used, uh, we used hydrocortisone initially in varicella pneumonia and that worked effectively. A Spanish study of non-COVID patients with ARDS used DEX uh, 20 milligrams for five days, then 10 times five days. And in the, uh, the Fernandez Cruz study, they used one milligram per kilogram today of methylpred and possibly DEX eight milligrams BD, then one milligram, and then eight milligrams daily. Please note, it should not be used in people that do not have the pneumonic phase. In other words, patients that do not have uh, hypoxemia and do not have pulmonary infiltrates. So it isn't of value in that setting and therefore generally is not to be used at home. Colchicine does have an anti-inflammatory effect. It accumulates in granulocytes and monocytes and has ensuing anti-inflammatory effects and may also have an effect in terms of decreasing the coagulopathy and that therefore is a possible, uh, possible value. The Greco study actually looked at a small number, 105 hospitalized patients. Colchicine group had less clinical deterioration, uh, one patient versus seven patients, and the deterioration in controls was driven by a need for mechanical ventilation. But there was no difference in peak troponin or the CRPs as well. Somebody asked about ivermectin. There's been one or two small studies. They're not randomized controlled trials, and they compared against hydroxychloroquine and azithro. Uh, they did not receive corticosteroids or anticoagulation, so we don't know whether, in fact, there was a true benefit as well, and they're generally observation, observational study. This actually showed a mortality in, in ivermectin of 15 versus 25.2%, and that was significant. But again, with all of those uh, confounders, it's very difficult to say that ivermectin actually is of value. We looked at uh, NAD plus nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleide, 
dinucleotide deficiency, and that is decreased in the age of the obese and type 2 diabetics, and uh, also those patients, all those patients who have a risk for mortality in terms of COVID as well. And if we look at that, looking at the bottom bullet point there, niacin or nicotinic acid requires a, a molecule called CERT1, uh, which is an important uh, molecule, which is an intrinsic uh, reducer of your own cytokine levels, requires both zinc and NAD plus in order for it to function appropriately. So all of those situations in which you have a high risk of death, they also have a low NAD plus level. We also give vitamin D and we mentioned sunlight earlier, but vitamin D is a negative, negative endocrine regulator of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And SARS-CoV-2 downregulates ACE2 expression, increasing inflammation and injury from neutrophil inflammation and an unbalanced RAS activation as well. We also give vitamin C as a nutritional antioxidant as well. So what pharmacotherapy would I recommend? Uh, if we're looking at patients who either are admitted or get are in at home uh, or are looking at prophylaxis, vitamin, vitamin D, 50,000 units stat. If you're giving it for, every, uh, for prophylaxis every two weeks is useful. Zinc, if you're being admitted, uh, 20 to 50 milligrams daily for five days or 10 to 20 milligrams daily if prophylaxis or at home that you're treating patients there. Vitamin C, 500 TDS, the same again for prophylaxis. Nicotinic acid, 35 milligrams daily, and the same for prophylaxis and prophylactic anticoagulation as well. And I'm not really going to go through the mnemonic phase in hospital unless people ask uh, what uh, questions on that point as well. Just remember also that many people have persistent symptoms. This, this looked at 292 patients. 94% had more than one symptom at diagnosis and 35% of these had not returned to their usual state of health at a median of 16 days post-testing. 26% of those aged 18 to 34, 32% of those aged 35 to 49, and 40% of those at greater than 50 years. 43% uh, had a cough, 35 uh, fatigue, 29% with shortness of breath at diagnosis still had these symptoms. Prolonged illness occurs even in young patients, and the risk factors for prolonged symptoms are age, uh, the, uh, the presence of other comorbidities, in other words, three or more, obesity, a psychiatric condition, all of those associated with not returning to normal. Respiratory complications are those of the most concerning, chronic cough, lung fibrosis, bronchiectasis, and pulmonary embolic disease. 30% with SARS or MERS had persistent lung abnormality, mostly with a mild DLCO reduction of 70 to 80%. The risk factors for moderate or severe COVID-19, however, are similar to those for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Age, range, and males, and COVID targets the alveolar epithelial cells like herpes, which has been implicated in IPF pathogenesis. Age-associated cellular changes might reduce the ability to respond to viruses and therefore giving a dysregulated repair and fibrosis mechanism. And the BTS guidelines recommend a chest X-ray and oxygen saturation should be performed at least three months post-discharge for those with moderate or severe disease or with persistent symptoms and refer those patients on thereafter. We've heard a little bit about herd immunity. We know that the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein uh, is, uh, the, has S-reactive CD4 T cells which respond to that spike glycoprotein. It's present in 83% of patients who've had COVID and interestingly in 35% of unexposed healthy donors. And these T cells in the healthy donors react primarily to the C-terminal S-terminal S isotopes of the uh, SARS-CoV-2, but they actually have higher homology to the spike glycoproteins of the endemic co coronaviruses that we see seasonally in our country as well. Uh, as well, in other words, there is some cross reactivity from past exposure to the endemic viruses. Cross reactivity in 35% may affect the pandemic dynamics, with implications for design and analysis of vaccine trials. So just a word, the modeling we know had been wrong, but the reason the modeling had been wrong was as the minister had said, we had no statistics to guide us 
at that time as well. The lockdown is purely really to delay the peak. And of course, only really a value of preparations are actually made to prepare the hospitals for that, uh, that uh, uh, surge. Lockdown will probably, in my view, not decrease the eventual infection numbers because they will occur at a later time at an endemic rate, which will eventually lead to the same numbers that we actually have. Community testing, other than looking for incidents in the community, is generally a waste of time because the results were certainly delayed and there was minimal case tracing that was actually performed. It's also no value testing employees pre-work because of the fact that they could then contract the virus in a week's time. So that test initially is not going to be of help to them. Deep cleaning is a term manufactured by the cleaning companies and has made a fortune for many of them. And it's a complete waste of time and wiping down surfaces appropriately is the best way of doing it. Many lockdown rules were in fact nonsensical. Specifically, we're looking at super spreading events like taxis, uh, funerals, religious gathering, and then of course, uh, not allowing people to go to parks where transmission is almost certain not to occur because of the open air in which you are. And of course, smoking has no uh, impact on uh, COVID as well, except that of course, being a pulmonologist, I'm happy if people didn't smoke, but unfortunately, it seems the majority of people who do smoke continue to smoke as well. Not only that, I'm very worried about the fact that I read in the paper and whether it's true or not, I don't know, that the WHO 43 recommended intermittent lockdowns, and that would be disastrous to the economy, much like intermittent uh, load shedding would be if that continued over a long period of time, but only would actually be worse. So thank you very much for that, and I'm willing to take questions as well. Thank you, Prof. Um, so uh, as discussed with you earlier today, um, I'd like to ask, I'd like to share with you if your consent just to, to, to everybody uh, uh, something your, of your, one of your personal things. And that's that Prof Richards is actually a COVID-19 survivor himself. So in this time, Prof Richards contracted COVID-19. Um, and as a, as a retired Prof, or as you heard, um, he's done exceptionally well. And it's something that's so encouraging for all of us. Um, so, so perhaps we could ask you, I, I mean, without having to elaborate too much on your course of, of, of your illness, like how, how do you feel? Are you, are you now in a position of one of the long COVID patients? Like perhaps I could ask you that. And something else just from the talk that you just gave is if you believe that, um, that the virus does not peak, or we'll put it this way, that the lockdown will not decrease the number of cases, but rather just spread them out over a longer time, are we looking at a long, long course of this virus affecting our society? So well, I think I'll answer the, the, my opinion on, the, on the, the last one, but of course, Salim would also be able to comment there. As, as you saw on his graphs, the virus became endemic. And in fact, they flattened out, but didn't disappear. So people continue to become infected over a long period of time. And ultimately, until such time as you hit herd immunity, or a vac an effective vaccine comes, that endemic phase is actually going to continue and the numbers will continue to occur as well. So that certainly is the case. You're quite correct that I uh, did have COVID. I was, it is, and I'm sure many of you have as well, uh, and it is a somewhat anxiety making um, situation because you don't know how sick you're gonna get. And unfortunately I brought it home to my wife and my son as well which is something that many doctors are, are concerned about, is bringing this, uh, this illness home uh, to your family. Fortunately, all of us have recovered. Um, I've recovered well, and I don't have uh, any of the persistent effects at the moment, except for a bit of a, a niggly cough, which, which remains. But I don't have the exhaustion. And the one thing that is people that have had it will tell you about is um, a COVID fog in terms of your brain. But that certainly does occur during the disease. You feel like you have a, a, a foggy mental process and your cognitive functions actually appear to be, uh, to be decreased. Uh, and I was quite worried about that. I thought all of you guys would be saying, well, you know, he used to be quite good, but now he's, uh, he's, he's slipped somewhat. Uh, uh, but hopefully that's not the case. And, uh, but thank goodness we've all recovered well. And any of you who've had it, I'm sure you will do as well. 
Thank you, Prof, and well done. We, you're an example to all of us. Um, thank you. Um, so so we, we, we run everything we do in the GGPC collaboratively. And for the, with all the other talks that we've had, we've really used the doctors on our on our WhatsApp group, as it was started by Dr. Van der Merwe, have really brought their contacts and connections into to, to the to the fore. And doc, we were grateful here that Dr. Fanerov, who's asked a question tonight already, was able to introduce Dr. Jankola, our next speaker, to the to the group. So I'm going to ask her just to explain who Dr. Jankola is, and let's hear from him. And thereafter, we will take a general Q&A. And we normally go for about two hours in total, so we still have a bit more time. Might push about 10 more minutes more or so. And if I could just ask you just to look in the Q&A, because realistically, we've over had over 100 questions. We're not going to be able to answer all those questions. We may be able to create something where we answer these questions and then put that out afterwards. But if you go, could go through the Q&A, instead of asking more and more questions, just upvote the ones that you feel are important, because those are the ones we'll deal with. But over to you, Dr. Fanero. Um, I just want to thank David Jankola for joining us and for bringing his expertise. I first met David in 1997 when I was an intern at what was then Johannesburg General Hospital and David was a cardiologist on one of the wards. Um, he's now a clinical cardiologist at Linksfield Clinic, very much involved in working really closely with many COVID patients in high care and in ICU. He's working closely with physicians and pulmonologists on the ward. Um, David is also the president of the South African Heart Association, and he was very involved in putting together um, a document that they presented, I believe, to the Ministerial Advisory Committee, outlining some of the cardiovascular complications of COVID and their position on that. So I'm hoping he's going to share some of that with us. David's very excited about the future, which is always good to hear. And he's particularly interested in technology, disruptive technology, and lots of innovation. Welcome. Um, just before David speaks, um, I, I'm, I understand that um, Minister Mkise has another meeting that he has to go to. Um, so I, I just before he leaves, um, I, I, I want, he's actually stayed much longer than originally intended, and we're very grateful for that. So I just wanted to thank him so much for spending this time with us. And hope that there'll be opportunities for future engagement um, where we'll be able to, to, to you know, engage with, with the Department of Health and learn from the Department of Health and offer just, you know, learners group of colleagues. But thank you so much. And we, we're really grateful for your time uh, on this platform. Thank you very much. And congratulations for a well done uh, webinar. And thanks to all the panelists. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Over to you, Dr. Jankala. Well, thank you very much. Good evening to you all. Um, thank you, uh, Daniel and Sh uh, Sherry, um, uh, for putting this all together. And I feel humbled and honored to be included in such an illustrious uh, panel. Firstly, uh, Honorable Minister, Professor Karim and Professor Richards, um, thank you for what you do. Uh, thank you for your leadership. And I'm in awe of what you do every single day. I just want to just share my screen. It's, uh, just trying to just get my slides up, one second. Can you all see that? Daniel, can you see that? Yeah, yes. we can see perfectly. Yeah. Anyway, um, well, thank you very much. And I've been asked to speak um, with respect to COVID and um, heart disease. Yay. Firstly, um, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank you for putting these webinars together. And we at Linksfield Clinic are working in physician groups. And the sense of camaraderie with teamwork has really been incredible and um, the minister has alluded to this. And this is a message from the European Society of Cardiology, which um, I think is most apt. In these testing times, never has community meant so much, never have we, we relied on each other as we have during this pandemic. Your selfless dedication to your patients and to the mission we all share is a source of enormous pride uh, to the whole of South Africa. And even in the midst of COVID-19, you all continue to share your experiences, your science, your advice, and help each other out. 
So thank you to all of you, the frontline family doctors. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm proud to be included. I first want to speak to you as the president of the South African Heart Association, which really represents um, the professional interests of everybody that works in cardiovascular medicine. And we represent the scientific leaders in this field. And our mission and vision is to advance cardiovascular healthcare for each and every South African citizen. And our association is founded on four pillars, which include science education membership, and importantly, importantly advocacy. Um, and uh, that's, that, that's become a very important uh, part of our mission statement. We recently were honored to be invited by the Honorable Minister and the uh, Health Department to engage and to develop a position state statement with respect to COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. And I wish to give you the essential messages from this document. With a background to this, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death world divide and claims up to 18 million lives every single year. And heart disease used to be a problem of the rich, but now it is striking the world's poor and it is responsible for a third of all global deaths and most of these are occurring in the developing world. Every single day in South Africa, 225 of our citizens die because of heart disease and every hour, five people will suffer a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, and 10 people will suffer a stroke every single hour. The treatment of these conditions is most certainly time sensitive. And with respect to myocardial infarction, the quicker you open up the blocked artery, the better the patient does. So time is muscle. Equally so with respect to stroke, time lost is brain lost. COVID-19 with its diverse clinical manifestations may certainly increase the numbers of patients with heart disease. And when we engaged with the minister, I quoted that more than 100 years ago, the father of clinical medicine, Sir William Osler, said that the great mimicker at the time was syphilis, then came across, then came the HIV and AIDS epidemic, and that was even a bigger mimicker. But I think that COVID-19 is now the, uh, now takes the cake in this regard. It is well known that patients with underlying cardiovascular disease or any NCDs, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, are, are at a much greater risk for adverse outcomes if they contract COVID-19. But it's important that they're not at increased risk of, being, of becoming infected with the virus. These patients, um, or, in, or, 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 or during this time or at increased risk of not receiving the level of care that they, that, uh, they require. And as you know, there, there's this intense fear by the public uh, that they may contract the virus if they, contract, or if they consult a doctor or a specialist. So many patients, as you well know, are canceling follow-up appointments. They're not seeking medical attention in the first place. place. And, we emphasize, and an emphasis should be made that even during the pandemic, the public should not delay seeking care. Every minute counts, especially in cardiology, and hospitals, cardiologists, and physicians are doing their utmost to treat patients in a safe environment. So SA Heart has become increasingly concerned in this regard, and we fear a second public health emergency with respect to cardiovascular disease and other NCDs. I quote you from a recent article from the World Heart Federation, the unprecedented burden of COVID-19 on health systems threatens to exceed hospital capacity, making it challenging to care for other emergencies requiring hospitalization and care such as acute coronary syndromes. Fortunately, it seems that we're over the peak of the curve and the numbers are, are, are down. Um, and that's our experience in the hospital where I work. Hopefully we won't um, go through a second surge. It is well known that out of hospital cardiac arrests have surged and patients are less likely to receive CPR from bystanders 
in this uh, in 2020 compared to a year ago, and they're more likely to die before reaching hospital. This is a global phenomenon because a third of Americans report having delayed or avoided medical care because of concerns of catching COVID-19. And this has recently prompted eight professional societies in the US to issue a joint statement urging those experience symptoms to seek care, especially um, for life-threatening events. So once again, I reiterate the public, particularly if they're symptomatic with angina, shortness of breath, dizziness or syncope, should not delay in seeking uh, uh, health care and treatment. And I think you as a major group of family physicians have a significant role to play in in God. Well, COVID-19 is not only a respiratory disease, and there's much more to consider than the issue of oxygenation and respiratory distress. And physicians need to be vigilant, vigilant for uh, complications such as thrombotic events, arrhythmias, myocarditis, and heart failure. And potential mechanism include, mechanisms include virus-induced inflammation, an increased risk of thrombosis, ischemia due to increased oxygen demand, microvascular ischemic injury, immune-mediated injury or a cytological storm. And this potentially could lead to coronary plaque rupture leading to a myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome. Arrhythmias may also occur. Um, um, we've seen some patients with atrial fibrillation. The physicians that I work with are particularly concerned with, when sick patients with COVID have a sinus bradycardia. I'm not sure what to do but other, about this other than to keep these patients on close monitoring or telemetry. We haven't seen patients with heart block um, uh, um, in the group that uh, I've been working with. Patients with these complications, including elevated troponins and other biomarkers of inflammation or damage, have a higher risk of mortality. And it is well known that a raised troponin is common in patients with moderate to severe COVID-19 and is associated with a poor prognosis. Myocarditis was proposed as a mechanism, but it is clear that on biopsy studies that there's minimal inflammation. But the whole situation, with respect to raised biomarkers and troponins needs to be assessed in the context of the clinical scenario with the history, symptoms, clinical examination, ECG abnormalities, and importantly, echocardio echocardiographic findings. So is there left ventricular dysfunction, a regional wall motion abnormality? Is there pericardial effusion? Is there a dilated right side or pulmonary hypertension? Is there potentially clot in the right side? Um, these, are, these are important factors to consider. The management or current guidelines, a guideline recommended treatment should be applied, including the use of standard heart failure therapies, such as beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, and especially those with left ventricular dysfunction. Um, we've seen a lot of patients with elevated troponins and when i've evaluated the vast majority of these patients actually have clinically and echocardiographically normal hearts i've been thinking if this represents subclinical myocarditis then perhaps these patients should be tr uh, treated with beta blockers i'm not sure of the answers at this point in time this is a recent article that raised um, uh, 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 a lot of concerns um, 70 out of 100 recovering patients post COVID-19 had abnormalities, cardiac abnormalities on cardiac MRI imaging. There were some criticisms in, in the way the data was represented and what this actually represented, but this does highlight the need for ongoing investigation into the long-term consequences of COVID-19. COVID-19 has been associated with prothrombotic abnormalities, as Professor Richards uh, alluded to, and these patients are at increased risk of venous thromboembolism, and prophylactic anticoagulation is most certainly in, uh, indicated. Certain groups of patients require full anticoagulation, and the physicians have a scoring protocol to determine which patients should be treated in this way. 
I want to show you a key, a key message from an article from the um, Krutoskia group, which is lessons from the global experience, cardiovascular care in sub-Saharan Africa during the COVID-19 crisis. Firstly, the vast majority of patients presenting with symptoms and signs of acute cardiac disease will in indeed have acute cardiac disease and they should be treated as such. And although the finding that, that there's an increased prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease among those presenting with symptomatic COVID-19, that this is high, this does not mean that the corollary is also true. In fact, the opposite is true. The vast majority presenting with acute cardiac disorders as their primary presentation will actually be COVID-free, and the vast majority of patients with COVID-19 do not have cardiovascular complications. And this is extremely important because there's the temptation to delay diagnostic workup and treatment of acute cardiac syndromes until the patients have been tested and the disease has been excluded. And this has major consequences. And as I, as I said, the outcome of most um, acute cardiac disorders are time sensitive and time depend dependent. So if you need to test the patient for COVID-19, do so, but really don't ignore the obvious in front of you. And once again, you as a group of family physicians have a major role to educate your patients in this regard. When we engaged with the health department, we are asked specifically about the use of uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers in patients with COVID-19. And as Professor Richards uh, described, SARS-CoV-2 infects human cells by binding through its spike prote proteins to the ACE2 receptors, which are abundant in the heart, uh, blood vessels, kidneys, and lungs. And ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers will, in will increase ACE2 receptor upregulation. And it was postulated a number of months ago that this upregulation could possibly increase the risk of a more severe or even fatal COVID-19 infection. However, the, the evidence is not, um, not in keeping with this, as renin angiotensin inhibitors may actually be paradox paradoxically protected against serious lung complications. The S2 negatively regulates the renin angiotensin system by converting angiotensin 2 to vasodilatory angiotensin, and this opposes the vasoconstrictor and inflammatory effect of angiotensin 2. And in experimental studies, ACEs and ARBs re reduce severe lung injury in certain viral pneumonias, and it has been speculated that they may actually be beneficial in the setting of COVID-19. There, um, there were significant concerns, as I said some time ago, and this prompted four societies to issue statements. Firstly, the Council on Hypertension from the European Society of Cardiology, and SA Heart is a member of the European, of the ESC. They strongly recommend that patients should continue treatment with the usual, usual antihypertensive treatment, treatment regimes, because there's no clinical or scientific evidence to suggest that, to suggest that treatment with ACEs or ARBs should be discontinued. The Heart Failure Society of America, American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association also recommended continuation of uh, RAS antagonists for indications such as heart failure, hypertension, or ischemic heart disease. Um, this is Professor Praveen Manga, who's one of our SA Heart Board members, and he's the Emeritus Pref Professor of Cardiology at WITS, and he's also the editor of the WITS Journal of Clinical Medicine, and he wrote um, uh, a really good review, should ACE inhibitors and ACE ARBs be withdrawn in the current setting of COVID-19? The answer is categorically no. These agents should be continued in patients with CVD and associated conditions such as diabetes and renal disease. He asked me specifically about return to exercise and return to sport? Well, I found some recommendations. Firstly, it requires common sense as with any other viral infection, 
um, that, uh, that patients uh, could suffer. Uh, viral replication can be enhanced during vigorous activity and potentially could lead to damage to the heart. In symptomatic athletes, they should re refrain from intensive or competitive exercise for at least two weeks. Those who remain symptom-free with no abnormalities on ECG, they can return to full participation without restriction. However, symptomatic, symptomatic athletes with no evidence of myocarditis should be restricted from exercising for at least four weeks. If thereafter, a thorough medical examination is normal, and this includes an exercise, uh, an ECG exercise stress test and an echocardiogram, if these are normal, they could then resume exercise. Athletes with myocarditis, as per guidelines, they should not exercise for at least three to six months. Um, one commentator said, be careful, COVID-19 still has many facets that we do not know exactly. I'm going to stop there, but I invite you to look at the SO Heart website saheart.org. I also invite some of you with an interest in cardiovascular disease to become a member of SA Heart. Um, on our website, there's a news portal and we're posting almost every single day um, uh, items that are relevant to COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um... Very interesting. Um, lots of questions around cardiovascular disease, and it's interesting how the how this disease has progressed from a pure thought of pulmonary, pulmonary disease to a cardiovascular disease. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just I'm going to move forward. So what we'll do is we'll take two live questions or so, and um, I, I might skip, just quickly go through a couple of test questions before we close off. We clearly aren't going to get through all the questions, but we will try and put together something else, either with, by means of a, a talk or a, a document as the GGPC, where we address all these questions. We have captured them. So let, let me quickly hand it over here to Dr. Cora van der Merwe to ask a question and uh, take it from there. Um, hello, thanks very much, Dan, and all the panelists. It's been a really excellent evening. Um, I'd just like to ask Prof. Richards um, about convalescent plasma and whether there is evidence for that in COVID management, and if so, at what stage of COVID would it be used? Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Sorry, just before Prof. Richards answers, I just, I've just i been speaking to Prof. Karim here, who also has to go, and we are, we are you know, 10 more minutes or so of time, so we're going to leave the last questions as clinical questions for Prof. Richards and Dr. Jankalo. So again, like I did with the minister, we left the, the, the epidemiological questions for the beginning and the clinical for the end. So I just want to thank Prof. Um, Karim for being on the panel again, for giving up your precious time and for, for, for sharing your advice with us and for supporting us all as clinicians. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, uh, okay. Salim. Thanks, Prof. Karim. Okay, over to you, Prof. Yes, thanks. Um, <clears throat> The evidence is not particularly good at the moment. Um, in fact, both um, the WHO and the IDSA, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, actually state that currently there is insufficient evidence, despite the fact that Donald Trump has said that it would be an effective therapy at this stage. There is some interesting data which indicates if given early, it would have more benefit than if it's actually given late. So, and that also has some problems because the logical time to actually administer it would be when you're at home and you've got minimal symptoms because that's the point when the virus is actually multiplying, but that becomes not practical and there wouldn't be enough plasma available to actually utilize it in that fashion itself. So patients who are admitted, uh, if given very early, it may actually have an effect on decreasing um, symptoms and uh, decreasing viral uh, expression. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Prof. Um, okay, so I I'm going to the Q and A. Um, Oya Sande of your of your man, sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, who is actually in Bloemfontein, has been asking about PEs in patients. And uh, since we have Prof. Richards on 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 the, the webinar. Can I, can I, if you prepare to ask your question live, can you, can you summarize your question as a, as a brief question? Otherwise I'll ask it for you. Uh, 
Like, I, I think I'm he not sure that. There. Yeah, I'm not sure he's there. So he just said that he has a couple of non-hospitalized healthcare workers who um, referred to, uh, patients to him for a ventilation perfusion study with mild cases presenting with persistence or a new onset of dyspnea or tachycardia after the isolation. A good number of them are having PEs. They're currently, they're currently gathering data for the for publication. Um, but they're seeing that even patients with mild symptoms are having PEs, and they want he wants to know some exploration about the significance of this. And this has come up on our previous panels: is that patients, you know, we're using D dimers as, as indications as where who to consider as having a PE and not. And even in our general practices, we're seeing patients who post COVID are coming with chest pains, and the question is, how concerned should we be about PEs? I mean, if they're not high risk patients clinically, do we go looking for PEs in patients, especially after COVID? Thanks. Well, if, as I indicated on that one pathological slide, it is or does cause a procoagulin state. And there is a risk, therefore, for both macro thromboses and micro thromboses. One of the problems is that you do develop a diffuse pulmonary intravascular coagulation. And that is in the pulmonary microcapillaries. But you may also develop macro uh, thromboses with pulmonary emboli. And in fact, it is certainly those patients who are symptomatic significantly so, even if, if they are at home, should receive prophylaxis. Uh, not full anticoagulation, but prophylaxis. Uh, the ideal would be a form of heparin, because as I indicated, it has antiviral activity. That's not always possible, although enoxaparin and others can be administered at home. And if, in fact, you're unable to do so, then something like one of the NOAX um, the novel oral anticoagulants could also be used to decrease the presence of, uh, of uh, or decrease the consequences uh, of the coagulopathy. Thanks, Prof. Um, Do you mind if I say something? Yeah, yeah sure, go ahead. So um, I've been involved with uh, uh, quite a few patients and I recall two particularly with COVID, um, uh, severe COVID pneumonia on ventilators that really deteriorated with significant drop in uh, their BPs, saturations, and with almost massive dilatation of the right side of the heart. Now, they're too sick to take down to do a CTPA or a, a perfusion scan, and we empirically gave them uh, thrombolytics. You feel un, uh, uneasy about doing it because you really would like to to make a diagnosis before giving thrombolytics. Uh, those two patients didn't survive. And I'd like to ask Professor Richards about um, uh, empiric thrombolytic therapy in, in, in these very ill patients with massive RV dilatation. Unfortunately, because of the fact that you develop diffuse pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy, you often, and also because of the ARDS, you often get massive right ventricular enlargement. And so it doesn't necessarily mean pulmonary embolism. There have been one or two case studies looking at thrombolytics where they improved, but those patients obviously did have massive pulmonary emboli. And in fact, the vast majority don't improve because the primary abnormality is in fact related to the lungs rather than being at the parenchyma, rather than being normally to the, um, to the vasculature. But I would uh, recommend that all people, if you're treating sick patients at home, that you should, I would recommend doing a D-dimer and a C-reactive protein. If the CRP is increasing and your D-dimer is high, that patient should be anticoagulated and you should be considering admitting that patient to hospital. Thanks, Prof. Um, I've got Levasan Pillay we've put on the panel here. Um, he, he, he's a sports physician or he practices our sports physician protocol here in terms of working out um, exercise post COVID. And uh, he had asked a question which has partially been dealt with. But let me, let me ask you, give him opportunity to comment to Dr. Jankula. Good evening, uh, panelists. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for providing me for this opportunity to sit on your guys' uh, talk today. So thanks very much. Uh, I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician, and uh, I was quite keen on joining this talk, especially to listen to Dr. Jankalau's views on return to uh, exercise, et cetera, which I completely agree with. Um, um, we, I, I was, I was in, in, in line of developing protocols for the return to football. And I started working on these documents from around uh, March before any evidence was available. 
And I'm happy to see that we're starting to realize that it's more just not only a respiratory disease, but a cardiovascular disease. Um, the one, I just want to uh, make a few comments about some of the things and where people can get access of more information with regards to the exercise in patient. The South African Sports Medicine Association has come out with a position statement on return to sports of the post-COVID patient. Uh, it was written up between myself, Professor Krista Janse van Rensburg, who's the president of SESMA, Dr. Marke Ramacholi, Professor John Patricius, uh, Dr. Pierre Viviers, uh, Dr. Pato Zondi. Um, so we came up with this position statement like most sports people, sports uh, uh, societies around the world are coming up with, looking at lots of evidence, uh, uh, not, not really evidence, but more commentaries that were put out um, previously by other researchers like Adam Bagish, uh, the, uh, the Sumeru model from a cardiovascular perspective, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm happy also that I can hear Dr. Jenklau has now also specified that we must differentiate between the symptomatic COVID patient and the asymptomatic because the investigations and the return to sports uh, recommendations will be very different in those two spheres. Um, what, what, is, what, is, what is good is that it provides us an opportunity to begin cardiac care from, a, from in, in the exercising athlete where normally they did not do that. So if we have a baseline ECG, at least we have something to compare to when they have uh, post COVID and to make sure where they go into and if it's safe for them to return. And it provides an opportunity to help change lifestyles and get through this mental block that most people have been through over this last five to six months. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's just as important from the clinical aspect that what we're doing, as well as the mental aspect, like I think a lot of people on the quiz, uh, the Q and A's have alluded to the other effects of COVID-19 and not just the physical effects as well. So yeah, thank, thank you for the opportunity for me to just uh, pass a comment there. And thank you very much to the speakers and the panelists. Uh, it was a very educational session. Well, thank you very much for your comments. I invite you to share your recommendations and your position statement with um, SA Heart. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Pillay. Um, I'm just going through the last, for the last few minutes, to the last three or four minutes through the, the questions I've received some thumbs up here. Um, I see um, Dr. Cohen, who actually lives overseas, has asked, and she asked this on the last panel as well, about... Um, overseas, there's a, there, there seems to be a, a, a practice about still asking patients to do negative, to get negative swabs before de-isolating. Um, but specifically in the context of patients with who, uh, compromised immunity, so like so HIV positive patients would need to show that they have that they that they have negative swabs. And perhaps the thought there is that the virus or the viremic phase can last longer in patients who have compromised immunity. Is there, Prof. Richards, is there ever any evidence that um, patients who have reduced or not intact immune systems will have a different length of time than the expected 10 or 14 days? No, there isn't any evidence that that is the case. <clears throat> and we don't do repeat uh, testing because as was indicated by Prof. Uh, Salim, uh, that the virus will still pick up a positive PCR, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a live virus. So it picks up a piece of the DNA and will amplify that and recognize that as being the virus, but it's not infectious. So it, it, and that same thing applies to patients who happen to be immunocompromised. We've just gathered together our patients who are HIV positive and compared those who are HIV negative and we're not seeing a decrease, a difference in mortality. In fact, uh, there's a trend towards a reduced mortality in those patients who are HIV positive. And that uh, we're going to be publishing shortly as well. Thank you. I'm picking out while I have you there. Someone's asking about monticolasts in the prevention of severe COVID. Is there um, evidence for that? No, there's none. It's a leukotriene receptor antagonist. Uh, whereas the leukotrienes are important pro-inflammatory mediators, particularly in asthma, there's no evidence currently that there's any value in the setting of uh, COVID. So we don't use it in, in the setting at all. 
Okay, great. I mean, just and this, is, this is really more, I suppose, an epidemiological question, but I see it's a, it's a bit of a theme that's coming through the questions here, but talking about the death rate. Um, a few of the, the doctors have asked her, and we've seen this in the media, but how, and I really would like to have asked the others this, but there seems to be a different death rate that's been reported, and then with this, un, this unaccounted for death rate that perhaps could be linked to COVID that hasn't been linked to COVID. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that, Prof. Richards or Dr. Jenkins? Yeah, well, I think that there are a number of factors involved in the lower death rate that we, for example, have in Gauteng. Number one, we have more ICU beds in Gauteng, private and public, virtually than the rest of the country combined. So that actually benefits us tremendously. Um, in addition to that, areas such as the Eastern Cape, where uh, there is a significant rural community or other provinces where there are big rural communities, we may be missing a large number of the COVID-19 patients. I don't think that in Gauteng we're missing particularly large numbers uh, of COVID-19, but we are having excess deaths. And I think that many of those excess deaths are related to chronic comorbid diseases that patients actually are living with and are not coming to hospital for their appropriate therapy. So we're seeing those excess deaths at the moment related to other diseases where people are stopping their therapy because they're too scared to come to hospital. And that's exactly the role that I think that the message that we need to put out here to all of us as doctors is that, we put out, you know, we, we may not be able to treat COVID in terms of yeah, giving an antidote, so to speak, for it. But certainly as primary care physicians, we need to be able to, we need to be telling patients that they need to do their screening. Um, one of the, the, the doctors who are involved in breast, uh, breast cancer prevention and screening has said to me, you know, remind patients to still go for their mammograms um, to, to, to have their screening and prevention checks. And I think that's really important. Um, uh, we're not going to get through all the questions. There's a ton of questions to be to go through. I think as a team on the GGPC, we will tackle them. Um, we still plan on doing things in future. We, we really encourage everybody to be a part of this and to, to you know, you know, and, and we'll be, hopefully we'll have future panels and um, some, some with more clinical focus and some with less. Um, what I just what, what just to share with everybody what we're planning on doing for the next um webinar and I'd actually said on the previous one that we were going to do this and next and we, we, we came up with this one first just because of logistics but um we, we'd like to focus a little bit inwards so this, this is the webinar we're looking at doing um we, we feel like we spend a lot of the time looking at COVID-19 and you know, really dissecting the situation and all the clinical things. But we, we as doctors are um, often the casualties of COVID-19, whether it's the people who have got it, who've had it or have it, or it's practices and the deep um, almost recession that practices are experiencing, certainly in the private sector. Um, and also just the psychological issues that patients, are, that doctors are experiencing in terms of um, depression and just anxiety and bringing COVID home. And so for the next one, what we're looking at doing, and we're looking at doing it soon, like probably next week we're going to do it, and then we'll have a few weeks break after that, is just um, looking at, look at our, at, 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 and this will have a very, very different focus. We're not going to be discussing the science of COVID-19 yet, but rather the science of the doctor. And we're going to look at the body, the practice, your, your body, your practice, and your mind over this time. Um, we've got Professor Barry Shub, who actually founded the NRCD, and he's going to talk a little bit about, you know, the current thoughts of immunity and also the antibodies that we we're testing at the time. And, you know, are doctors immune? How can they stay safe? Um, how can they look after themselves over this time? Um, Mr. Louis de Silva is the CEO of HealthBridge, and he's going to be talking about all the trends that he's seen in terms of practices being down, um, you know, claims, where are we going, how to protect yourself. He's called it inoculating the business of your practice against COVID-19. And then we've got two great psychologists, psychologists and trauma therapists who will be coming on and actually speaking to doctors who've had COVID-19 and letting, you know, we're encouraging doctors, whether they're on our GP group or from the outside, who want to talk about their experience of having COVID. Um, and, and just, we, we've done, I've done a webinar of this kind of things with patients. Sorry, that's my 
my electricity saving has worked. Um, so we've we've had we I've done this in pay, with patients. We're going to allow doctors to share the experiences so we can grow from one another. So we're really looking forward to this. Um, probably won't be as long as the seminar, but will be a very enriching and more like emotional experiential seminar. So we really invite everybody to be. Um, a part of it. So, so thank you so much. Um, my, my thank uh, Dr. Richards or Prof. Richards for being a, for, for, sh for sharing so much time with us, and Dr. Jankula for sharing so much time with us. And my also thank Dan Stillerman. Dan Stillerman runs the Excel Academy. He's really the wizard at training people in terms of uh, companies, in terms of Excel, and really how to get the, the most out of that. But more than that, over this time, he's become. Um, really the master of webinars for so many people in this community. And like he's sitting in the background here promoting people, organizing links, um, doing all of this. And he's taught me a lot, but this particular one, I mean, I really couldn't have done without him. So he's always here for the GGPC and he has been for five, six, five, six meetings now. And really, uh, we, we, we honestly owe him a very big thank you for his ongoing support of all the things during this time. So... Um, We'll send out the, the information about the next one. Thank you all for staying on so late. Um, and um, that's it. We can call it a night. I mean, Dan, if you want to, if you want to show that doctors can sing you, or you ask me about that, you're more than welcome to. Um, a, a, a while guys are logging off, and you're welcome to log off during it. Um, but thank you all for being a part of this. And I'll, please keep well and look after yourselves and your patients. Thank you, Dan. Thanks very much, Daniel. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Because this is the song that um, our GP group put together a few months ago, um, just to uplift people. So you're more than welcome to leave during it or stay till the end. Have a good night.
Thanks very much. These doctors really rock. If you manage a team,